Good evening, folks. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're here to talk about Romans again. We are. We're roaming through Romans. We, we, we are. <laughs> and we've been roaming through Romans for quite a while, but we, we actually last week came up with the session for this week because it's a very important topic. And this time of year, uh, it's a big question for a lot of people because things happen at this time of the year. Mm -hmm. So um, be with us. Uh, we don't in any way plan to answer the full extent of this question, but we're certain, certainly willing to ask it and to give you some of the thoughts that we feel the Holy Spirit has given us. And hopefully it'll prompt you to consider even more thoughts that the Lord gives to you in, in asking this question. Yeah, so our question is, why do we have to go through suffering? Or why do we suffer? You know, sometimes I think when we present the gospel to people, when we, when we talk about Jesus, we, we, uh, we, we, we talk to somebody and they're, they're going through, you know, some struggle or another struggle and, you know, uh, come to find out that that they don't really have a relationship with Jesus and they're starting to feel like, wow, the, the Holy Spirit, or they're feeling the drawing of the Holy Spirit. And, and, you know, you pick up on the fact that they're feeling the drawing of the Holy Spirit and you say, brother, sister, God wants to help you with the struggle that you're going through. And, and uh, you know, with good intentions in our heart, we, we, uh, we lead them to the Lord of, of, you know, Jesus is our hope of salvation and, and, the scriptures certainly support that, you know, that, that there's help in knowing Jesus. And, and, and we talk to them about that. And a lot of the times people will will uh, uh, pray a prayer to God and, and start a life of following Jesus. Um, but sometimes I think in that conversation we present things, well, well, Jesus is God, right? He was man, took on flesh defeated all the troubles of the world he had victory over them all and now you're going to be able to as well you know and and we kind of leave it at that like like hey now now that i'm a christian everything is gonna I, i'm gonna defeat everything you know but i i don't know if if the scriptures really bear that out because it talks about suffering a lot there's an identity we have with christ in his suffering paul spoke about it in Philippians, Peter talks about it, John talks about it, and it's important for us to recognize that Jesus is our help in time of trouble, a very present help. Absolutely, and, and I believe that we should draw people with that understanding that Jesus is here to help you. Because folks, when we're left to our own, we really make a mess of things, really bad. And what God does is he shows up in the middle of the mess and he cleans it up for us. However, when we accept Jesus, we have to recognize that we now are going against the things of this flesh and of this world. We are we're going contrary to that. And because of that, there will be sufferings. And uh, we need to be prepared for that and understanding, okay, uh, this thing has come upon me. Uh, this situation's come upon me. Uh, God, is there anything in my life that, that would be the reason for this? And that was, that's the first thing is we submit ourselves to God and then we can resist the devil. Yeah, you, you know, when Jesus went around preaching the gospel, yeah. you know, it says that, that he went around preaching the gospel, which means good news. And the gospel is this, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So repent and believe in the gospel or repent and believe in the good news. That means whatever we're going through, there's a good news about how God would want to handle it through the kingdom of heaven. So yeah. there's certainly the hope of Absolutely. walking through suffering and finding out the good news that God has to help us with it. But we still, there's still going to be walking through suffering. John the Baptist said, are you the Messiah? And Jesus said, go back and tell him that the, the dead are raised, the blind can see, um, the, the lame can walk again. Uh, you know, he was he was telling him, absolutely I am, because these are the things I'm now doing in people's lives. And so we realize God is the God of goodness, and he does bring good things into our life. However, there are things that God allows us to walk through for purpose. And that's, that's this question, why do we suffer, or why does a Christian have to suffer, is because there's purposes that God uses in the midst of that suffering that we can't learn any other way, folks. 
Um, I'll give you an example. If if you desire to be a um, a mechanic or an electrician, uh, you will walk through difficult times trying to figure things out as an apprentice because they want the journeyman wants you to learn how not to do things and how to do it the right way, and it's just. That's just a, a natural way that we think in, in this world. It's They have to learn by doing. And yes, there are mistakes that go along with that. And if that's true for us that are natural, how much more is that true? How can we get to know that God is the mighty deliverer, the healer, the provider, unless we walk through times where we need to see him deliver us or we need to see him heal us or we need to see him deliver us from those situations? We, we can... We can talk an empty talk about God from a theoretical standpoint. But what God wants us to do is be able to talk about him with substance in an experiential uh, standpoint and and uh, perspective is that I know God can do this because this is what he's done for me. I mean, it's, it's, it's real. And the only way that we get to that point is by the things we walk through that we see is suffering, is hard times, problems. Uh, and some of them come on us by just being in this world, and some of them come upon us because there are people out there that don't like God. There is persecution in this world that happens today uh, because of people that, that don't like Jesus Christ, that don't like God. We see that in other parts of the world. So as Christians, how do we... Um, how do we consider suffering? How do we do we run from it? Do we embrace it? Where our whole life is nothing but all I've known is the troubles, and nobody knows the things I've seen and walked through. Uh, how do we deal with suffering? And I think that Paul holds out a a really good understanding. He says, "Look, whether I abase or I abound." In other words. If I'm humbled, if I'm walking through a tough time, or whether I'm walking in a prosperous time, I've learned this, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I'm content in that, that it isn't my strength, it's God's strength that is operating in my life. Whether I'm blessed or whether I'm walking through a time of, of need, that, that God is there with me and helping me through this time. And Paul said this, he said, in the process of this, and I'm paraphrasing, in the process of this, I am gaining knowledge of who Christ is in me, the hope of glory. And uh, how important it is for us to not run from suffering. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there is some of the church in the United States that has that has been taught that if you're a Christian, you don't have to suffer. You know, you can you can you know command this and command that. And you know, there there's some truth to that. Is there's things we can walk through that we can ask God to change. We don't command Him, but we we can command things in the world through the name of Jesus Christ. But there are times when God uh, allows us to walk through those times. And my point is this: when Jesus was in the garden. He prayed three times, Father, if this cup can pass from me, let it let it happen. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And, and he didn't deal with that question once, but three times he dealt with that, the severity of what he was going to walk through with the Father, just like us. We walk through times where we go, God, if you can get me out of this, get me out of it. But nevertheless, God... Keep me in the midst of this thing. Don't don't allow me to to go belly up on you. Let me serve you and honor you, even though I die. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, good example. You know, they suffered at the hands of of Nebuchadnezzar, but the glory that God got through their suffering. They were thrown into a furnace to be incinerated, and yet God delivered them. And the and the ropes that they were tied up with. And I'm sure that they were not tenderly tied up. I think those guards, probably uh, the angst and the anger that Nebuchadnezzar felt was, was something that he put onto those soldiers. And they, they hogtied those guys, threw them into the furnace, and ended up perishing, the, the guards did. 
And yet, what happened? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got up and said, wow. Yeah, they were delivered. God's with us mm -hmm. in this suffering. Yeah. And it, it glorified God. So there's many aspects of suffering that we need to consider. We're not going to be able to do it all today, but we can we can hit some major chunks of it. You know, there's a lot of suffering described in the Bible, you know, and and what I I think, you know, kind of reflecting on my own experience, um, there there have been times when God delivered me instantly. I, I know when I became saved, you know, there there were there were struggles that I was going through where God just fixed them. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, you Isn't know, that amazing. Yeah, yeah, just like that, he he totally fixed them. And then um, there were other things that I was struggling with at the same time that that uh, uh, he, he spent years working on with me. Mm -hmm. And then you know, uh, but he did eventually work through those things with me. And and I, I I saw the hand of God moving through it. You know that that God said this, so I did that. And then I waited. And I'm like, God, did you forget about me? And then then God says no. <laughs> Uh, be patient and and you know you know you need to do this and so on and so forth and i discovered just this uh this wonderful journey of following god and and how he directs us and leads us and has good plans for us uh through the the conflict and the struggles that i went uh, that i've gone through and and that's helped me to see god's personal involvement in my life and and it makes makes me wonder what would happen if if Every time I declared God's healing or redemption or, or, or whatever over a situation, if the situation was always instantly healed, I, I, I would be a spoiled child of God, <laughs> you know? And, yeah. and uh, you know, I, I, I don't know that the, 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 the character of God would become refined in me, mm -hmm. you know? And the, the fire of suffering, the scripture talks about it, about how it produces character in us. You know, and and that's so important because I'll, I'll tell you what there there are people, probably Christians and myself at various times, who have not re represented Jesus very well to the world around me, mm -hmm. because the character of Jesus wasn't perfectly refined in me. But one of the ways that that God helps us uh, grow and and to reveal His glory is through our suffering. So we should actually read the verse. You know, that would probably be a good start, David. <laughs> so today we're looking at Romans 8, 17, but because uh, last week we talked about verse 15 and 16, but verse 17 uh, would be like half of a thought if we didn't start with verse 16. So uh, can you go ahead and read that? Because I only copied down verse okay. 17. Verse 16 says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God and we talked about that our identity our relationship with with God as a child and then verse 17 says and if children heirs also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Wait a minute, back up a second, because I don't like the second half of that <laughs> verse. I, I, I like to think about how I'm a child of God, yeah. so I'm an heir of the kingdom of heaven and all of its benefits. Hey, verse 16 is awesome. The yeah. Spirit himself <laughs> testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Woohoo! Hallelujah! <laughs> and verse 17 starts out pretty good. And if children, heirs, heirs, also, heirs of God and and a fellow heir with Christ, and so, then so do I get first pick of his <coughs> of his vehicle, his sports cars collection, <laughs> or, or, or or the mansions fellow, that he owns. Fellow heirs of Christ, yeah, you probably you, you could, but I don't know if it'd be first pick. Maybe yeah, but then it goes on in the same sentence. Paul takes us into this thought of if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I, I don't like the if there. No, that if there is so we're, a hinge word. We're an heir if. Yes. So so what's the if again? If indeed we suffer with him. I don't like that. I know, we don't. You know, we are called to be heirs of the Father. We are children of God. And when we're called into the family of God as his children, it predisposes us to live a life that glorifies God. Um, you were born into the Yarborough family, and you were predisposed to move around wherever your dad got his next job at. You didn't have any choice on that, did you? So not fair. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it was because you were born into his family. Yeah. You were predisposed right. to that. When we're born into God's family, we are predisposed to the operation of God's kingdom. And that is, is we all that we do, we do for the glory of God. We see it in our older brother, Jesus Christ, who we're joint heirs with. He lived, he was predisposed to always glorify God. He prayed and said, not my will, but thy will be done. Uh, he taught his disciples, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there's a predisposition that's put within us as a child of God to operate through all the things that we walk through in this world. Recognize sin has grabbed a hold of this world in a, in a big way. We see it more and more each day. And we see who's in control of the things of this world, the, the, the world forces, the principalities and powers. And what we have to recognize is that we are God's people. We are, we are his ambassadors. We're his warriors, and we are here planted on the earth to um, uh, make sure that we enforce the terms of defeat that Jesus gave to Satan at the cross when he, when he died, when he descended into hell, and when he ascended again. You know, when he descended into hell, he took back the keys that mankind basically gave to Satan back in the garden. Jesus took the keys of death and hell. No longer were they uh, kept in ownership by Satan. They were now again given back to Jesus. And even though the, in this world there's that predisposition of death, none of us are getting out of here alive, folks. It's either that or the rapture, one of the two. That we are now given a predisposition to operate in a way that glorifies God. And let's face it, there are times it's hard to glorify God. We walk through some really tough things. You know, there's a predisposition that, that kind of goes along with that that Jesus had that I kind of like my kids to have. Yeah. And it's that he only ever did what the, he saw the Father doing. <laughs> and he only ever spoke what he saw the Father doing. Now, I don't want those my kids to do that <laughs> about me, though, because I'm pretty imperfect. But... But uh, I, I, I think that that when you look at Jesus, so Jesus was going through a lot of suffering in, in his life. Uh, he also, I mean, if you really want to kind of think it through, so um, Jesus was born into a family. He lived in a town. Mm -hmm. um, people wanted to kill him when he was a child. So his parents moved around some, and then they finally became established somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and he probably spent the rest of his years growing, growing up in that location. And... and uh, um, he had to leave all of that behind when he started following Jesus. I mean, he, of course he followed himself. When he started following God, <laughs> the Father, and when, when he responded to the call of his mission and, and started following God's direction for ministry and, and his mission, uh, he left all of that behind. I mean, he talks about how, hey, the Son of Man doesn't have any place to lay his head because mm -hmm. he was fully focused on doing everything God the Father wanted us to do. Yeah. You know, and and uh, that included suffering. It it and it included leading up to a point of some big suffering and, and a lot of little suffering. You know, people talked bad about him. You know, people tried to kill him. He had to sneak out of town. His family, a couple times. his brothers and sisters, thought he was nuts. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they, they, they came back to get him and kind of rescue him. They, they him. taunted him. Hey, if if you got this uh, ministry to the public, then go to Jerusalem. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, they were taunting him. Well, go ahead, go to Jerusalem if you have this big ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, you have to read in between the lines. But basically, they were chiding him. Come on, yeah. come on. Yeah. You know, if you, if you think you're the guy you say you are, you know. It, yeah, then what are you afraid of? It, it, it was an audacious claim that Jesus made that he was the Messiah, the Christ. And his own family did not see that at first. His mother did. Yeah, but his brothers and sisters certainly did not. But I think even his mother, since she didn't really understand what that entailed, probably looked at what he was doing and was waiting for him to, you know, start doing the right stuff. You, you know? know, she she encountered the Holy Spirit, and uh, you think about God, the Son, being implanted in her as a single cell that grew. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Oh, you it know? is. You talk about suffering. You know, going through childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. She you know, suffered. There's, 
There's some scriptures here I want to read before we close. Well, well hey, before you read those, I, I, yep. I, I wanted to kind of transition that thought in, into what Paul wrote. Okay. So, so Je- Jesus... Jesus had to leave a lot behind in mm-hmm. in understanding he was moving into a place where he would be doing some suffering. Yeah, you know, and and I, I think the Apostle Paul is really like our premier example of suffering. Mm-hmm. And and uh, w- w- one of the things that that he said was uh, in Philippians he he talks about you know whatever gain I had I counted it as loss for Christ. So so he came to Christ with this idea that that. Everything I had that was positive, I was willing to count it as lost. So he's willing to let it all go. But but he goes on. He says, indeed, I count everything as lost because of the, of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Mm-hmm. For his sake, I've suf- suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may be uh, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and Paul had this, uh, he, he had this urgency in, in his spirit and, and in the way that he thought about things, that, that this any means possible you know that he was going to follow the Lord and and obtain everything that God wanted him to. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I I think when we're talking about suffering, I'm going to avoid suffering. You know, my my human That's reaction. F- hey, listen, if 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 I hit my thumb with a hammer, guess what? My thumb's moving. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Anything we can we, we 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 can do to avoid suffering, we're going right. to do that. And Paul determined that. That he, he was going to override his natural, you know, fear, the the, the flight response, mm-hmm. you know, to, to the fear of suffering. And he was going to override that and, and say, you know what? Um, what, whatever God has in store for me, that that's what I want. On his way to Jerusalem, several times it was prophesied that he was going to suffer. And they his, the, the people that were with him... Uh, tried to tell him, don't go to Jerusalem. Several times, the people in Ephesus, uh, his, the guys that were with him, don't go. Uh, one of the prophets prophesied, you know, that uh, whoever's uh, belt this is, you know, is there, this owner is gonna suffer. He's gonna go through uh, constraining times, not having freedom. And yet Paul said, don't do this to me. I'm, I'm willing to go and dive need be you know that Christ is glorified in me. So Paul was Paul was signed up for the long trip. You know, it didn't make any difference. Yeah, not everybody's called to be a martyr. No. You know, I mean hopefully, but yeah. <laughs> you know, hopefully not everybody is called to be a martyr. Um, but I I think every time that that we have to put our flesh down and say, you know what, I'm going to do what the Spirit wants rather than what I wanted, That on some level that's suffering. Mm-hmm. You know, it's certainly not like being crucified on a cross, but it's still like this process of denying ourselves so that God can be glorified through us. You know, and I, I, I think we have to evaluate ourselves sometimes and say, you know, and do, do I passionately want everything that God wants for my life, or do I passionately want what I want for my life? There's a choice. And we, yeah. we have to consider that now and then, I think, sometimes and kind of reorient our focus on what Jesus wants. You know, a good example would be Job. We talked about it a little bit um, earlier in, in our Bible study that Don and I did. Is That was a porthole into, into heaven. And, you know, Satan came and accused Job. Well, the only reason he serves you is because you blessed him so much. And so God allowed the things in Job's life to be removed, his wealth his family, even the support of his wife. And the Bible says in all that Job said, he did not sin against God. And there was purpose in the suffering that Job went through, and that was to bring God glory. And and to, and to show and prove to Satan that here's a man who's never seen me, is willing to die for me, serve me, honor me, and yet you who have seen me, you you think you can do better than me and i we have to recognize that there is this um not a battle but there's this contention that satan brings that 
he can do better than God. He's always done that, uh, even when he was in heaven before he was cast out. And God is using the church to prove that he is, um, he is able to keep people who have never seen him in the midst of all that they, and terrible sufferings that Christians have gone through over the 2,000 plus years. Let me read a couple of verses here. Um, James, who was uh, in a sense uh, a chider of Jesus, didn't believe who Jesus was, yet becomes one of the leading elders in Jerusalem in the midst of the persecution, uh, became in a sense the, the, the anchor for the persecuted church in Jerusalem, writes in James this, in uh, James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. This is one of Jesus' half-brothers, right? Did you yep, see that? right. You know, yeah, ra rather is, than James and John, this is actually not that James. This no, is this isn't Jesus's James and John, the sons of Zebedee. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus, that said, If you're the Messiah, go to Jerusalem. Uh, that's the James we're talking about. And now he's turned around. Oh, yeah. yeah. Jesus had a come to Jesus meeting with him. <laughs> I think it is. Pretty cool, isn't it? Yep. James chapter 1, verse 2, 3, 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. And that word trial means tests. Knowing that the testing of your faith does something. So there's joy in knowing this. there's purpose in what we suffer. There's purpose in what you suffer. And it is this, the testing of your faith produces endurance. And the word endurance there is a Greek word, hupomeno. And that means to continue under, to walk through that thing. Um, you know, when I was in the military, uh, there were guys that talked the talk. And then there were guys that walked the walk. And I would much rather follow a guy that walked the walk than the guy that talked the talk. Because they were, the people that walked the walk were people of substance. They they didn't cut and run. They walked through whatever they needed to walk through to get to the objective. And, and people follow someone like that who has substance, who, who has sincerity, and is bona fide with, I know who I serve, and we're going to make it through this thing. And the only way that we can learn that is by walking through that thing with God so that we have that experiential knowledge, not the theoretical that I talked about earlier. It goes on to say in verse 4, and let hupomeno, or endurance, have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect. The word perfect there means mature. In other words, and how does maturity come? Through experience. Mm -hmm. You know, that's basically how maturity comes. Um, that you would be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. And so... We may suffer loss in the world, but we grow through the trying of our faith where we lack nothing. Nothing in what? In our relationship with God. We know him, like Paul said, the fellowship of his suffering, the power of his resurrection. Peter says this, verse, uh, 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 1 Peter 1, chapter 1, 6 through 9. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, we're talking about Peter who denied Jesus three times, who ran from the thought of suffering. He saw what Jesus was going through. Yeah. And he ran from that. He said, I don't know that guy. He even cursed. I don't know that blank, 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 blank. You know, he... He, he put himself in the position of saying, look, I, I don't want to walk through this suffering. He denied Christ three times, folks. And yet, here's Peter saying this, and verse 8 says, And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. John, Peter goes on to say in chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fire or ordeals among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. In other words, when it gets tough and hard, rejoice even harder. <laughs> Make that choice. 
um, so that at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. There's coming a day when we will see Christ and we will go, it's worth it all, Jesus. It's mm -hmm. worth it all. Yeah. And, and we get to, in this world right now, we get to praise and worship God in the midst of our suffering. Folks, we're not going to have suffering in heaven. It's done. Yeah. And, and what better way to bring the highest praise to him but in the midst of our suffering, in what we're walking through right now, how much more precious is that praise than the praise we can give to him when everything is fine? It really is. <laughs> As you know, you're not on your own when you're going through suffering. No. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't leave you to deal with it on your own. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, this is also Paul talking about how uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, blessed be the God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Mm -hmm. You know, He who comforts us in all of our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. How and, can we comfort others unless we understand what comfort is? Exactly. Yeah. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Mm -hmm. So it, he's here to walk through these things with you. And by all means, he is our savior. He, he is the help coming down the hill, you know, the Calvary showing up to save the day, mm -hmm. you know. And and I, I, I can tell you from my own experience that there's, there's forms of struggle and suffering I've gone through where he has been the Calvary coming in and, and freed me from it, yeah. you know? And, and then years later, like on similar kinds of struggles, like, so you can imagine God freed me from that, you know, but now I'm struggling with the same kind of thing, but maybe on, on a, like a, a more, a more intense level, you know, you're talking about maybe stress and anxiety and things like that and finding out that, wow, like, I, I'm not struggling in the ways I used to struggle, but now I, the new circumstances of life present a new struggle. And, and you know what? With prayer and petition and supplication and seeking the Lord, God is able to show up in, that, in those situations too. You know, and, and the answers don't always show up in the first moment. It's kind of like the movie where, you know, they, they battled all night and as the dawn, the sun's coming up, finally the help arrives or yeah. something, you know, and... I, I found that in that process, God, God's been able to comfort me and teach me that, 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 that he is always there for me and that that comfort is there, that I know like, that he's done it before and he can do it again. I, I, I believe that. <laughs> and I can trust him for all of my needs. It almost sounds like something I've heard recently. And, and uh, he's done it before, folks, and, yeah. and he's there for you now. Whatever you're going through now, he's the God of all comfort there. And and you might feel like you're abundantly sharing in, in Christ's sufferings right now. Well, that means that you can abundantly share in his comfort too, which is what Romans uh, or 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we should pray. Amen. You we know, and, and, and I have a feeling that some of you are going through some kind of suffering. And you might be suffering yourself, or you might be suffering for the sake of another person you're concerned about. You know, and this time of year it seems to um, happen where somebody tragically dies through disease or a car accident or something, and uh, and uh, it seems like there there are experiences that that envelop people to the point where they can hardly function through this time of year. Yeah the, yeah, the hurt is somehow magnified through the spirit of the holidays yeah. somehow. And so um, this is a time to realize that God's there and he'll help you through this time you're walking through right now. And he'll bring purpose into what you're walking through. He really will. He is the God of all comfort that you just read about. Yes. Yeah. So, Father, I just pray over the different ones who are listening and the different struggles and suffering that they're going through the things that have broken their hearts and uh, have hurt their trust in you and have made them wonder if, if, if this is all worth it because of their suffering and, and lord i i know that uh, while you don't always stop the suffering um 
you always show up mm -hmm. with your comfort. And I, I know I know that that is is something that that your heart longs to be with your children. And when you look at, at, at them and see them suffering, your your heart longs to just envelop them in your comfort. So I pray that, that you would envelop, uh, the the people of God who are listening, and then uh, maybe some other people who don't even really think of themselves as people of God. They're just they're just considering uh, what, whether or not you're real. I, I pray God that you you would reach out to them and touch them in their comfort mm -hmm. uh, or in their suffering with your comfort, and that you would surround them with comfort, and that they would feel just the hope and the encouragement uh, and the life that comes from the presence of God. Lord, in this, in this holiday season, that you would be Emmanuel for them, God with us, and uh, that, that your presence would be there to, to show them not only uh, that you're, they're not alone, but also to remind them that help is coming. Mm -hmm. And that e even though they might suffer for a day or a week or a month or a year, uh, that this suffering is not forever. And that, that there, is, there is the hope of... of of course, in eternity, being freed from suffering if we're children of God, but also there's the hope of, of uh, just the miraculous, supernatural power of God moving on our behalf here on this earth, too. Father, thank you for being a God who understands us, and Jesus for coming to this earth and experiencing the suffering and the temptations that we, the, we all walk through, and being able to endure and be victorious and give to us your victory. I pray for my brother and sister that you would help them to see your victory in their life and whatever it is they're walking through. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You're so good to us. Thank you, Father God, for loving us through your son, Jesus. Yes. It's in his name, the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you folks. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight, and uh, we'll see you next week. God bless you.